day hearing a hush in the crowd. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Lakeville Historical Society. My name is Mike Chapel. I'm the president of Lakeville Historical Society. And we're going to be presenting some very interesting family history of Irish settlers to, uh, today. I know all of you are interested. Anybody in the room got Irish background? <laughs> wow. What a surprise. We were originally going to put this on in March 2020. And the uh, epidemic, a pandemic, which we've all come to hate, called COVID interrupted. And we spent the next two years looking out the window, wondering if the world was going to end. But one thing's for sure, you can't keep the Irish down. You're back again. And we're all looking forward to the presentation, so I won't spend a lot of time uh, on this. We're going to be filming it, just so you know. That's my camera set over there. We're using smartphones now because it gives a better picture than a movie camera. Uh, so I'll put that up on the YouTube channel that we operate, the Lakefield uh, YouTube channel. And uh, I'll announce that at Vintage Lakefield. If you want to know in advance, you can subscribe to the channel anytime, and you're going to notice when I put videos up. And I put probably at the moment, probably 10 a month up. Uh, a lot of those are older videos that we've recorded in the past that we're remastering for the future to preserve that for future generations. So uh, we'll get started. And first thing, we're going to have the land acknowledgement from uh, Diane Chapel. We respectfully acknowledge that the former village of Lakefield is located on the Treaty 20 Michisagi territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagi and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Herb Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Brahma, Bosley, and Georgia Island First Nations. Lakeville Historical Society respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and the caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that it will continue to maintain this responsibly to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. Thank you, Diane. And I'm going to turn it over to Sharon Clancy now, who's going to uh, introduce our speakers, and then we'll let the evening flow as it may. Nobody can ever hear what's being said up here. Can you hear me back there? Yes, it's down a bit. Down a bit. How's that? Okay. Good evening and welcome. When I retired from teaching, I became very involved in researching the genealogy of my family with the help of my daughter, Cheryl. We were doing very well one evening when my husband said, don't waste time looking for my relatives. I have none. The next week, I accompanied my granddaughters to ferry camp at the Centennial Museum on Armour Hill in Peterborough. While they were playing fairies, I wandered over to the museum's display, which turned out to be a celebration of Peter Robinson. The ships he brought to the New World were posted with the family names listed below. And guess what? Out jumped the Clancy name, John Clancy. So it turned out that Ray, the man who said he had no relatives, had a family that emigrated from Ireland as Peter Robinson settlers before any of the rest of us. <laughs> to provide more insight into what this means, in 1822, the British government decided in favor of an experimental emigration plan to transport poor Irish families to Upper Canada. Ireland was experiencing a severe, severe depression and Irish farmers were subject to back rents and evictions as the value of Irish goods fell. Meanwhile, Upper Canada was in need of settlers to develop the recently surveyed townships. Peter Robinson was the son of United Empire loyalists 
and the elder brother of Upper Canada's powerful Attorney General, John Beverly Robinson. <coughs> he was appointed to manage the immigration. He began promoting the scheme in County of Cork in Ireland, taking advice from Lord Ennismore and local magistrates. In 1825, Peter Robinson returned to Ireland to supervise an immigration. 50,000 Irish paupers applied for the voyage. Having first secured letters of recommendation outlining their qualities and usefulness as settlers, those elected received embarkation certificates allowing them to board a particular ship. Peter Robinson immigrants came from particularly the Blackwater area of North Cork, Waterford and Kerry. In this area, the majority of the population were native Irish, Roman Catholic in religion, and speaking Gaelic as a mother tongue, but with many people possessing a knowledge of English by 1800. Following centuries of English control in 1691, Ireland had come fully under the control of the British crown. As a punishment for numerous rebellions and revolts, the 18th century saw the imposition of the penal laws. The largest Catholic rising occurred in County Wexford in the southeast of Ireland, where the rebel army of 10,000 enjoyed some successes. However, after the decisive victory at the Battle of Vinegar Hill in June of 1798, the rebels were eventually beaten back with sporadic violence occurring in the first years of the new century. If not actively participating in the 1798 rebellion, the future Peter Robinson settlers, the eldest of whom would have been in their late teens, early 20s, would have certainly been familiar and, po and possibly sympathetic with the rebel cause. Interestingly, a large hill in Duro was long called Vinegar Hill in acknowledge of the famous battle. What are the memories of Vinegar Hill, Lakefield, Ontario? Or do you dare to tell? <laughs> okay, some people understand what I'm talking about now. <laughs> Robinson recorded 2,024 passengers on board nine ships. Upon their arrival at Quebec, transportation was arranged to Kingston, where the settlers halted to await Robinson's arrival, and the sweltering summer heat and ague began to take its toll. The journey continued to Colbert, north to Rice Lake, through thinly inhabited country. And finally, a 40 kilometer trip by barge up the Otonabee River. Now remember, there's no dams. Uh-huh, 40 kilometers. By the fall of 1825, each family was relocated to a log shanty on property on one of the local townships. Ashfidel, Durrell, Dummer, Emily, Annismore, Smith, and Otonabee with provisions and tools for their first Canadian winter. Families with proud names, Ryan, Sullivan, Casey, Hickey, Fitzgerald, McCarthy, Clancy, Hannon, Leahy, O'Brien, Foley, and Shanahan settled throughout Peterborough County, and thousands of their descendants remain in the area today. Although life was difficult, these new Canadians helped to build a prosperous community. Many families stayed on the land allotted to them, and some left and went to live in Peterborough. John Sullivan had a home on the northeast corner of George and Hunter. Most of us remember it as the Uptown Silk Shop. Okay, that John also had a pub in the front part of his home. His daughter Ellen met and married John Clancy. John Clancy had a building under construction further along on Hunter Street. It was built for $5,000 by architect E. Belcher, contractor A. Rutherford, and the brick and stonework by P. McNamara. It had three stories with a two-story annex for kitchens. Part of the structure was built over the creek, meaning Jackson's Creek, supported by rolled iron girders imported from Philadelphia, size 60 by 30, with stables out back. It opened as Clancy's Hotel in 1883 under the ownership of John Clancy and his father-in-law, John Sullivan. 
John Sullivan was Ray's great-great-grandfather, and John Clancy was his great-grandfather. In 2006, it was des designated a heritage site and today goes by the name of the Red Dog Historical Hotel. <laughs> okay, now you know where we are? <laughs> to conclude, I have a poem from our town laureate, Tom Junkin, called The Rebellion of 1962. Now, to help with the language of the poem, you need to be familiar with some Irish terms. Shibin means shanty, do means liquor, Orangeman's Hall is the small building at Nassau that became Trent University's rowing club. I'm not sure what it is today. Frickish Sea is a meat cut up, cooked, and served with sauce. Just remember that. <laughs> it was deep in the heart of Durrell at Sullivan's Shabin. Sure, the lads were celebrating the wearing of the green. Tommy tickled his fiddle strings. Grandpa took a swig. He grabbed his old shillelagh and danced an Irish jig. Philip played the juice harp. Father O'Toole poured. Mrs. Murphy danced the twist and everybody roared. Mickey McManus done a step. Romeo sang some songs all about the shamrocks and the tiny leprechauns. They put on their bed. Oh, sorry, I missed a page. Patty told some stories then about Pat and Mike. The way the dew was flowing, I've never seen the like. The band played breakdown out behind the trough, and all joined hands and square danced. Tim Croak called off. They were all singing and laughing and having quite a ball until the noise reached Nassau at the Orangeman's Hall. Let me see why I said you needed to know where that little hall was. The Protestant boys were rehearsing for the 12th of July. When they heard the Irish music, it was a battle cry. They put on their best uniforms, according to their code. With their fifes, drums, and banners, they walked the river road. Past the Mahonies and the Maloneys, past the Leahys, too. Past O'Brien's, Condon's, Heffernan's, smell the Irish stew? They rendezvoused at PG Towns. Billy said, now, Sarge, we'll circle Sullivan's shanty, then by God, we'll charge. The Duro boys were well prepared and aching for a fight. They put on their brass knuckles and turned out all the lights. I'll tell you all what happened some other day. I have it in another book, and it's a fricassee. <laughs> Tom was quite a man. I've got all of his poems. He and my dad were best friends, and he gave them all to my dad, and they never ceased to amaze me what the man could write. Anyway, thank you. And if you check out Robert and Peter Robinson here on this display, and some of the things over on the side, they'll show you the tools and things like that. And, and the, the amazing. Jack, Jack Sullivan did a fabulous job of his family down there, and Corey Hickey, Courier, did a fantastic job here. I just think that they did a marvelous job, and they're young people, and hopefully this is going to carry on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'm not sure who Mike has for his next person. I thought you were going to introduce the introduce an Mike. Okay, well, it's fine. Um, it, it can be Kevin, uh, Corey's cousin. For the hickeys? Okay. That glass of water is just for you, Kevin. What is it? Can you hear me okay? Well, my name is Kevin Hickey, and I'd first like to thank the Lakefield Historical Society for inviting us here tonight, and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share our story with you. 
Um, before I begin, I do want to thank uh, Corey Kerger, my cousin. She's my closest cousin. Um, in fact, we were only 13 days apart. And it was um, when I was born, my, my grandmother had three sons. And she desperately, desperately wanted a girl. And she only had three boys. So when I was born, being you know the first grandchild, I was um, I was like a star, right? I was the real deal yeah. for 13 days. <laughs> <laughs> then Corey came, and that was it for me. So <laughs> I do want to thank Corey for um, uh, she's she put in hours and hours of work in this. Um, what I'm about to share with you tonight is uh, is all her and and all these. Um, the, the display that you see, that's, that was all Corey. So I want to thank Corey for that. So my great, great, great grandparents, Cornelius Hickey and Bridget Berry, hailed from Ballyporeen in the county of Tipperary, Ireland. Now, in addition to being known as the ancestral home of the Hickeys, uh, President Ronald Reagan's family is also from Ballyporeen. Hickey, comes from the word, uh, the name Ohiki, which means physician or healer. Cornelius and Bridget had six children, two girls, Margaret and Catherine, and four boys, Morris, Thomas, David, and Cornelius. The father, Cornelius, was believed to have been thrown from a horse and died when the boys were young. In the 1850s, in the mid-1850s, all four boys immigrated to Canada and settled in Galway Township. A few years later, Thomas and Cornelius ended up moving to the United States in and around Chicago, but David and Morris stayed in Galway. My great-great-grandfather, Morris Hickey, was born in Tipperary, Ireland in 1933, came to Canada in the mid-50s and settled in Galway. In 1867, Morris married Mary Foley. So Foley just... <laughs> Remember that name, Foley. The daughter of two Irish immigrants, Patrick Foley and Catherine O'Donnell, who had moved to Galway from Duro. Morris purchased a 100 acre piece of land in, in Galway for $81 in, in 1880. He and his wife Mary established their farm on Lot 12, Concession 15 on the Galway Road in Galway. There they raised their family of nine children. He was described as a big man, well liked and respected for a sense of fairness, honor, and dependability. He was also a deeply religious man. And one story that my, my grandmother recorded was of an elderly neighbor woman that was very ill and Morris realized that she was dying. However, this was before the church was built in Galway and being Catholic, the closest priest to administer Holy Eucharist and last, uh, last rites was in Downeyville. So Morris rode on horseback to Downeyville to fetch the priest. Father Coyle, the priest at the time, his own horse was not well, so Morris hooked his horse up to the buggy and returned to Galway. The woman received her last rites, and Morris ended up driving the priest back to Downeyville the next day and returning back on horseback. So that sounds like a nice little story, but I Googled that. <laughs> That's 56 kilometers in today's mileage from where they are to Downeyville, one way. So I'm not, I'm not a horseback person, but I have ridden on a horse. That's a long way. In 1906, he left the farm to his son, Morris John, and he and Mary moved to Lakeville to retire. They lived on the river road at Sawyer's Creek on a farm that belonged to Mary's family, the Foley's. Lot 13, concession eight, Duro. The small house there was built by the Foley's in 1845. Morris eventually died there in 1913. My great grandfather, Morris John Hickey, was also known as MJ, was born in Galway in 1875 and was the fifth son. As a young man, he had a reputation as a, as a good teamster and spent several winters working in lumber camps and lumber companies driving teams of horses. In 1897, MJ, as he was known, in his early 20s, traveled to the United States to work and to stay with his uncles. Being a farmer, he was fascinated by the Chicago stockyards and the big state farms they had down there. 
uh, these farms were like a thousand acres each and they were kind of equivalent to our experimental farms here. But soon he was pulled back into the lumber business and worked in northern Minnesota with, for the McGrath Lumber Company. It was during this time that he actually almost died three times. First was when he was he got caught on a train trestle bridge when a train was approaching. With nowhere to go, he and his friends had to hang over the edge of the bridge until the train passed. Second was he was working in the woods, um, you know, with uh, dragging and team, you know lumbering, and a sudden forest fire roared, roared in with such speed that his men barely escaped with their lives um, on a, on, a, on the last lumber train to exit out of there. And finally, later that year, he became ill. Now, in those days, the lumber companies gave their employees hospital tickets. And so with that ticket, he checked himself into the hospital. The last thing he remembers, and then at the last, the, the next thing he remembers, I should say, is waking three months later. He had had typhoid fever and pneumonia. He spent a total of six months in that hospital. And when he left, he weighed 85 pounds. He returned home to Galway. And that was, that was the end of that. <laughs> but it makes you think though, how many people are here tonight and in and, and, and this book, in this story, that wouldn't be here tonight if, if he met his end there. A little later, MJ worked for the Dominion Steel Bridge Company during the construction of Peterborough Liftlock and worked there until its completion in 1904. While there, he met his great grandmother, Ellen DeFinney, who was a nurse at St. Joseph's Hospital. They married on September 18, 1906, in the newly built St. Mary's Church in Galway. When MJ's parents retired to the small farm located at Sawyer's Creek in Duro, MJ and Alan remained on the original Hickey homestead, where they raised their family of four boys and two girls, John, Frank, Joe, Anne, Mary, and my grandfather, Vincent Hickey. So my grandfather, Vincent Hickey, was born on June 10, 1912. He was the second oldest child in the family. After he completed lower school at SS number four Galway, he attended Baker Business College in Lindsay for a short period of time before returning home to work with his father on the farm and in logging. My grandmother, Marguerite O'Connell, was born in Downeyville on July 1st, 1909. She was the fourth child of Simon O'Connell and Teresa Malloy of Downeyville. As an infant, she had contracted polio, leaving her with a pronounced disability in her left leg. The everyday things that children take for granted, such as walking to school and tobogganing, skating and dancing, she was never able to do. She learned at a very early age that her only choice was to be kind to everyone, especially the few that teased her because she couldn't run away from them. Growing up, she was referred to as the smallest and frailest of the O'Connell children. She may have been small in stature, but she was mighty in determination. Despite her disability, Marguerite completed her lower school in Downeyville, high school in St. Joseph's Academy in Lindsay, and Teachers College in Peterborough. In 1930, after meeting with the school council in Galway, she accepted a teaching position at a one-room schoolhouse known as SS Number no. 4. It was agreed that she would stay at the, or board at the closest farm, which has happened to be the Hickeys. After successful six years of teaching and even more successful two-year courtship, she accepted Vince Hickey's marriage proposal. In June 1936, my grandmother resigned her teaching position, and three months later, she married my grandfather Vincent on September 7th at St. Luke's Church in Downeyville. Two weeks later, in their 1928 Whippet automobile, along with a dog, Lindy, a small black kitten, and a piglet that was given to them as a wedding gift. <laughs> I just I had visions of the opening scene of Beverly Hillbillies. Right? <laughs> they moved into the farmhouse located at Lock 25, more commonly known as Sawyer's Creek. It was here they began their own family. In 1938, their first son, Morris, was born. Four years later, their second son, Vincent. And three years after that, the third son, Cyril, was born. The neighboring farms at that time were the Galvins, the Coughlins, the Maloney's, the Denches, and the Hanrahan's. Not only did the family grow, but so too did their farm. Within a short amount of time, they had their own team of horses, a few cows, and chickens. In 1938, the barn that is currently there today was raised. 
Their one piglet that was given to them as a wedding gift was sold and replaced with two, which quickly turned into ten. And eventually, over time, pens and gates and fences were built, and those tens, those ten pigs grew to a drift of two hundred. Growing up on a farm, there was always chores that needed to be done, wood that needed to be cut and split, and hay that needed to be baled. There was, however, always time for catching suckers and swimming in the creek, skating on Harrigan's Pond, and of course, the annual hunt. Grandma used to say that come fall was like a fever that came over the boys. The deer hunt was always, and still is to this day, a trip back to Galway Homestead for a week and, of course, time off school. In 1949, their farm and the neighboring farms received hydro for the first time. Grandma and Grandpa celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary on September, in September 1976, and in June 1977, Grandpa died very suddenly at age 65, leaving the oldest of, our grandchildren, of us grandchildren with fewer than we would like memories of him. He was loved by all and was well known, uh, sorry, was loved by all and was known to be kind, quiet, gentle man, but with a low tolerance for bullshit. <laughs> My mother, when talking about grandpa, would tell of evenings in our house where the living room would be full of O'Connells. O'Connells was, were his, um, were his in-laws. And the conversations would be quite loud and boisterous Grandpa would sneak out to the kitchen where my mom was for a break, sit down, take a deep breath, and say, Well, cat, it must be a terrible death to be talked to death. <laughs> Grandma and Grandpa's house always had a tree house, a tree house to play in, and a tire swing in the backyard. Although Grandma left teaching position in 1936, she never really left the profession. She taught catechism at St. Paul's Parish and tutored her own boys in school work, which she used to say was her hardest job ever. She also tutored neighboring children and her grandchildren. She had an old school common sense way of explaining things that made complicated problems seem simple. Her reputation as a well-known respected teacher had her past students still coming to visit her well into her eighties. Grandma was also the go-to babysitter and when we were young, she would spend hours reciting nursery rhymes and telling us stories. Summer back then was dominated by cutting, baling, and bringing, bringing in the hay. But the best part of hay season was the food. Grandma would prepare three coarse hot meal lunches, and we would picnic in the fields along the stone fences under the big maple trees. Warm meat, cold potato salad, hot tea, fresh baked biscuits, and pie for dessert. She wasn't only cooking for her boys. Usually there was several Heffernans or Coglins or O'Connell boys and men there helping with the hay as well. Marguerite, despite her physical challenges, lived a long and wonderful life and she died peacefully in her home on June 2000, in June 2005. So my father, Morris Hickey, or Morris Joseph, was born on May 9th, 1938 in Peterborough. Morris went to school in Lakefield and graduated from Lakefield District High School he was quite active in sports and in clubs and won several 4-H and forestry club awards. After school, he worked in several, for several construction companies, including helping build the new St. Paul's Church in Lakefield. In 1960, he joined the Lakefield Dairy, where he worked as a milkman for just over 10 years. And, and I would imagine some of you here tonight may remember my father being your milkman. He loved that job and all the interesting personalities in Lakefield that he would deliver milk to. In 1962, Morris purchased a farm of Joseph Maloney, whose wife was Molly, and Molly was my father's great aunt, at Lot 10 Concession 7 Center Road, Durrell, for the amount of $12,000. Around the same time, my dad met my mother, Catherine Ann Collins. She was a teacher just like his mother and taught at St. Paul's Catholic School in Lakefield, St. Anne Catholic School in Peterborough, as well as in Oshawa. They married on August 24th, 1968, and moved into their new farm. There, um, they got busy. Over the next 15 years, they had 11 children, oh, seven boys, four girls. Also during that time, Dad grew the farm from a few cows and pigs to being one of the largest pork producers in Durrell Township. Now, having 11 kids running around a busy farm was a challenge. Several times, Dad would need to go to Grandma's place for or, or to town for something, 
and mainly mainly to avoid running over some of the kids, he would gather all of them all of them up and throw them in the car and take them for the trip. And it was only when he got to his destination that he realized what they were or were not wearing. If he was lucky, it would be like a scene from The Little Rascals, all mismatched clothes and socks and everything else. And if he was unlucky, it would be more like a scene from The Lord of the Flies. <laughs> Mom and Dad were very, were very religious and would take us to church every Sunday, dominating the front one or two pews. And that was because Dad was really proud of his family. And that was his way, that's one of his ways of showing it, is that he would put us all in the front pew of the church. However, it was, <laughs> despite that, it was not uncommon for us to have to drive back to church in Lakefield to pick up someone that we left behind. <laughs> you can imagine the look on the kid's face sitting on the church steps waiting for us to come back. And then the rest of us in the van just laughing. Mom and Dad also loved to travel. They took us on several road trips across the country. 13 people in a van built for 12, towing a trailer that slept six for a two-week trip with only one pink box. <laughs> most of us kids are now married and have families ourselves, and most of us have stayed close to home. Of the girls, Maureen, Janet, and Teresa live in Peterborough. My sister Karen lives on a ranch near Hannah, Alberta. All four of them work for school boards. Of the boys, Neil, Jim, Brian, and myself, Mike and Brian are here tonight, all live in Duro. My brother Paul lives in London, Ontario, or near London, Ontario. Combined, um, there are 29 grandchildren so far. And you never know, it might be roll the dice one more time. <laughs> My brother Mike and his family now live on the farm that we all grew up on, and it's primarily a beef operation now, and larger than my dad could ever have imagined. My uncle Vince was born on April 18, 1942 in Peterborough. Like his older brother, he went to school and graduated Lakefield District. Vince worked at the GE in Peterborough for 10 years, and during that time, he was quite well known as a dancer, like he liked to go to dances and would drive miles miles every weekend just to attend a dance. Now Vince, when he was young and a bachelor, wasn't always the most tactful person in dealing with children and would take great pleasure in saying something that if that was repeated would probably get that kid in trouble. So when innocent little Corey was young and Vince would be getting himself all snazzed up for a dance, she would ask him, where are you going, Uncle Vince? And Vince would jokingly answer, I'm going out Guri. <laughs> <laughs> so now when Corey later told Grandma this, Grandma said, oh, no, 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 no. He said, touring. <laughs> so to this day, poor Corey has this terrible, terrible understanding of the word touring. <laughs> After the G, Vince got his carpentry license and worked for three years on the construction of the new Darlington nuclear power plant. After this, he took up farming full time, but never really gave up his true love of hunting and trapping, which he still does to this day. Vince loved to travel and still does. He has never said no to a road trip, whether it was across Duro or across the country. He has many stories of traveling west in his suburban van, which he used to say was as good as any hotel room especially if you took the time to clean out the beaver pelts and the deer antlers and the traps first. In fact, at 80 years old, he and his daughter just returned from a birthday trip to Florida. Vince fought the fight as long as he could, longer than most of us, but finally surrendered. Vince married Teresa Donahue in Peterborough on November 2nd, 1985. They built a home next to the farmhouse where Vince was raised, the same farm that his great-great-grandparents lived in at Sawyer Creek. They have three children, Vince, John, and Kit. Vince is getting married this summer and lives in Peterborough. John is working in Alberta and Kit lives in Lakefield. My uncle Cyril, the youngest of the three Hickey boys, was born on February 5th, 1945 in Peterborough and attended Lakefield Public School and St. Paul's, uh, Paul's Catholic School during the first year it was open. 
While attending Lakefield High School, he landed his first job off the farm at the Lakefield Dairy, where he was hired to clean out the milk trucks. One day, after the men had left for the day, a truck pulled in for a delivery. All the trucks were parked in the parking lot, and the delivery driver couldn't pull in. Don Good stuck his head out the door and said, Cyril, can you move those trucks? Sure I can. Cyril moved the trucks around and made room for the delivery truck. Late the next day, Don asked Cyril if he, make an if he could make an unscheduled delivery to the hospital. Absolutely. The day after that, he made the same delivery again. Cyril showed up to work the following day and was greeted by Don yelling and screaming. It turned out that Don discovered his new delivery boy didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> Cyril attempted to explain to Don that he hadn't asked him if he had a driver's license, only if he could move the trucks and make a couple of deliveries. That <clears throat> just made Don angrier, and he was fired on the spot. Fortunately, the next morning, Alan Graham, everyone knows Alan Graham, with a big grin on his face, rehired him. Once Cyril graduated high school, he went to work at the GE for his apprenticeship and earned his machine operator's license before moving on to outboard marine for four years. In 1978, he became the shop superintendent at Trent Severn Waterway, a division of Parts Canada. From a very young age, he was always intrigued by taking things apart and rebuilding them. For instance, after school, Cyril would hop on his bike and race down the railway tracks, railway tracks as fast as he could ensuring that he would have something to fix on his bike when he got home. Morris and Vince were usually 15 minutes behind him while they cautiously rode their bike home, ensuring that they had nothing to fix when they got home. <laughs> For the next 43 years, Cyril oversaw the smooth operation of the Marine Railway and the Peterborough lift locks. And in 2004, he was privileged to attend the centennial celebration of the opening of the Peterborough lift locks, the same grand structure that his own great grandfather helped build. Cyril married Beverly's second writer on July 16, 1966, and they had five children, John, Corey, Bernadette, Angela, and Matthew. Tragically, Bernadette was lost at a young age of 20 in an automobile accident. Her loss was devastating to Bev, Cyril, Maggie, her siblings, and the whole Hickey family. And, and I remember that well. It was just the feeling of, you know, and helplessness and just felt gutted. Bernadette was beautiful, kind, energetic, and bright. It was impossible to be near her without smiling or laughing. Bernadette made more friends in 20 years than most people make in a lifetime. But over time, wounds heal, but they leave scars. And the scars are there to remind us that even though the pain is gone, we never forget. In 1975, Cyril built a house at Sawyer's Creek on a lot next to his parents' home on Hickey Road. For the past 29 years, Corey and Wayne have lived there and raised their family. Home, the home that was built by Cyril has hosted many family gatherings and celebrations and made more special with the arrival of Maggie Roy. Together with Bev, the two are doting grandmothers to Corey and Wayne's children and grandchildren. Now, grandchildren, remember that because not only did Corey steal my thunder about uh, you know being the first grandchild um, now she's also the first grandmother in the family so <laughs> of the cousins. Cyril and his wife Maggie an avid photographer love to travel with their family most people come back from a trip with some pictures they come back with thousands of pictures they live on one of the prettiest farms north of Lakefield, and since retiring, Cyril enjoys working on his plane, keeping in touch with past co-workers, and spending time in Galway restoring his grandparents' original log home. Maggie stays busy, ensuring that every family occasion is digitally preserved, and many of the photo albums and, and items here tonight that you see are a result of, of Maggie's work. Well, as you can see, hickeys may not be world travelers, but from the travels we have done, we know a good place when we see it. For more than 100 years, Hickeys have been living on and near the river just south of Lakefield. We have traveled, but we've always found our way home. My father and my two uncles spent their lives growing up on the river, walking, biking, and driving along it to and from Lakefield every day. 
My dad would often say he hoped or dreamed heaven was like that stretch of river between the creek and Lakefield. I hope too. Thanks very much. I think we're moving on to the Sullivan family. Hamish? No. Me, me too. Hand on the Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Historical Society uh, for highlighting the Solomon family. And I'm going to see if I can do a good job of finishing it off. <laughs> We're going to go back 250 years to begin with. My great great grandfather, Jeremiah Sullivan, known as Darby, was born about 1773, so that's 250 years ago. His family was from Brigham, Cork, County Ireland. They left from Cork Harbor, Cork, on May 16, 1825, on a ship named Regulus and arrived in Quebec by the end of June under a plan promoted by Peter Robinson. The family included Jeremiah, aged 52, and his wife, Alice Kelly, aged 50, along with their 10, grand their 10 children, Timothy, aged 28, Mary, 26, Catherine, 24, Michael, 22, Catherine, known as Kitty, was 20, John, 18, Dennis, 16, Jeremiah, 14, and Johanna, 12, and Alice, age 10. So that's where all these Sullivans came from. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the Irish immigrants took ill during the voyage to Canada, and some died. Word has it that during the voyage, the father, Darby, came down with cholera and died two days before the ship docked. Alice hid his death from the ship's officers because she didn't want him to be buried at sea. She succeeded in having him buried on land, but sadly we don't know the location of the grave in Canada. Alice had friends in Coburg, a community where the immigrants stayed for a time, and she left her two youngest daughters, Johanna and Alice, with them promising to collect them the following spring. Perhaps she feared that they were too young and not strong enough to face the arduous journey through the wilderness to their destination by boat and wagon. With several sons who were old enough to receive land, Alice settled in Duro Township on the east part of Lot 2 on Concession 6. I don't know where that is, but it's around Duro. <laughs> Timothy settled the east half of Lot 2, Concession 2, but sadly he was killed by a fallen tree, which was not uncommon fate among the settlers, who were not used to the bushwork. His brother Michael took the adjoining lot while John was given land in Autonomy Township, but he stayed with his mother for the first few years to help with clearing the land. Life must have been hard, for Alice never did get back to collect her two little girls and she left them behind in Coburg, although this has an interesting sequel to the story. Next page. The children of Darby Sullivan and Alice Kelly are Timothy, who was never married, Mary married Anthony Allen, Catherine married Michael Maloney, Michael married Mary Allen, Kitty married Timothy Leahy, John married Johanna Le Daly, Johanna Daly, sorry. My great grandfather Dennis married Mary Condon. Jeremiah <coughs> married Mary Welch. 
sounds to me like they're all Irish, <laughs> all sides. Now, Johanna grew up in Coburg and married George Towns. He was the son of Lydia and Sam Towns, who had come to the area in 1820 from Jefferson County, New York State. The young couple took up farming, and in due course, three children were born. Mary Eliza, Jeremiah, and John Towns. In 1846, the Towns family moved north to Duro, settling on Lot 11 and Session 5, where a new baby called Samuel George soon made his appearance. Francis Towns Lynch, a descendant of Johanna, says that Johanna and her children arrived by sleigh, leaving George Sr. to follow along, bringing with him the livestock and household furnishings. George arrived and ran the Duro Post Office from his home in the 1890s. He also stocked a few items to sell, such as tea and tobacco. Not long after their arrival, Johanna was reunited with her Sullivan family, which turned out to be a blessing, for tragedy soon struck the family. Johanna's husband, George, fell from his horse and after lingering for some months, he died in 1848. After his death, Johanna gave birth to a daughter, Hannah. Johanna Towns was a strong woman made of good stuff. Left a widow and five small children, she nevertheless managed to finish clearing the land and raised her family to be good citizens. In 1892, their son, Patrick George, known as P.G. Towns, operated a store in Peterborough, but he soon decided that he preferred rural life, rural life, so he opened a store in Duro, uh, in a Duro house two years later. I think we all remember P.G. Towns' store. He soon began to build the store, which was the beginning of the popular P.G. Towns General Store in Duro, which operated for many, many years. This amazing woman, Johanna, who had left Ireland as a girl, lived to be 82 years of age, passing away on August 27, 1895. It is impossible to mention all the interesting descendants of Darby and Alice Sullivan, but a few are of special interest. Reverend Monsignor John Thomas Pearson of Peterborough is a descendant of the Michael Sullivan and Mary Allen branch. During the 1980s, Monsignor John Thomas Pearson was the rector of St. Peter in Chain, St. Peter in Chain's Roman Catholic Church in Peterborough. In the Kitty Sullivan and Timothy Leahy branch, there was William Leahy, known as the Irish Flash. He was a runner who earned his nickname in the United States because of his great speed over short distances. His father, Patrick, was said to have been one of the best long distance runners in Canada at one time. William represented in the United States in the Pan American competition at the Buffalo Exposition, winning gold medals for the 100 yard dash and the 220 yard dash. Another of Johanna's descendants is great grandson William Bill George Towns, a man whose name lived, lived on in Duro. He was known far and wide as the township historian. His hobby was genealogical research, and before his death in 1985, he received the Ontario Bicentennial Medal for his work in the preservation of history. The famous George Red Sullivan is a great-grandson of Dennis Sullivan and Mary Condon. George Red was the grandson of Dennis Sullivan Jr. and his wife, Joanne O'Brien, and the son of Jack Sullivan and Regina Doherty. George was a well-known NHL hockey player and coach for several teams in the NHL from 1950 to 1975. As you can see, the Sullivans are much like the Dunford clan. We are relatively related to the Leahys, McManuses, Heffernans, Towns, Cochrans, Allen, Shaughnessy, Fitzgerald, Dorises, Mahoney's, O'Brien, and the list goes on. All Irish. <laughs> Another 
the son of Dennis and Mary Sullivan was my grandfather, Thomas Sullivan, born in 1848. He married Catherine Guerin on January 30th, 1883 in Durrell. He was the daughter of Martin Guerin and Johanna Mead. They made their home in the village of Durrell. There they had a family of eight children. Mary Jane, as we all knew her as our Aunt Minnie, James, Johanna, she was Aunt Jo, Maggie, Dennis, Martin, William, and my father, well-known Tommy Sullivan. Later, about 1920, they moved to the Block Road and farmed the land. I understand my grandfather died around 1907, leaving Grandma with eight children, my father being the youngest. <clears throat> Thomas Patrick Sullivan was born September 27, 1897, and attended SS number nine Duro School. He was introduced to the fiddle early in life and started playing the fiddle when he was about seven years old. Dad's first fiddle was made from a cigar box and some spools of thread. Yeah. Later, his brother Jim went down to John Meads and purchased a proper fiddle for $7. $7 would be a pretty good buck back in the early 1900s. However, it only had three strings, so his dad went to Peter Rowe and bought him new strings. <laughs> dad went to the barn, pulled some hair out of the horse's tail, fastened it to the end of a cedar stick. By stretching the horse hair and tying it on the other end of the stick, he created a bull. He then put some rosin on the hair and proceeded to play somewhat scratchy fiddle tunes. Dad claimed he never had a good violin. He was always breaking bones and many times uh, missing strings. Dad said his mother couldn't stand the screechy sound of his fiddle, so she locked him in the pantry to practice. <laughs> By the end of 10, Dad had lost his parents. He came to Lakefield to live with his older sister, Margaret. However, it was while living on the block road that Dad met his future wife, Geraldine Catherine Coughlin, as the Coughlin family lived just across the road, basically. Tommy and Geraldine were married on February 22, 1938. Geraldine was born on November 20th, 1920, the daughter of James Coughlin and Bridges Teresa O'Brien, and she was a bit of a folk singer. They had a family of eight children, Raymond, Tom, Dennis, Gerald, Fred, Annie, Jack, and Helen. We lived on Rabbit Street in Lakeville. Dad worked at the McManus Sawmill for a time, and he always had a great vegetable garden, and we raised chickens. With a family of eight children, things were tough, so we had two beds in each bedroom, sometimes three to a bed. <laughs> it took Mom four hours to do the laundry eating, heating the water in the wood stove reservoir and using the old washboard and tub. She was a great cook and loved to bake. With her tan around the dinner table, it was someone grouped or dropped, I should, in mom would just squeeze in another place if someone dropped in as an, as an example. Dad's grandfather had a 100 acre, 100 acre lot out on Lynchens Rock Road, which is halfway to Young's Point, near Buckley's Lake, which was passed down to my dad. In the winter, in the winter, he would trap beaver, uh, more up the muskrats, I would say, and tan the hides to make some money. And in Christmas, in December, he would go out to the woodlot and cut a few Christmas trees. A friend would bring them into town, and Dad would sell them for a dollar a piece, so Mom could have some money to buy a few Christmas gifts. As kids, we made our own entertainment, and skating in the swamp was great fun as we could skate all the way down to the cement works. I'm sure Sharon remembers that. <laughs> Dad loved the fiddle, and time and practice improved all. He went on to become an award-winning fiddle player. He, in the early days, he won top prize at the Peter Rowe Exhibition. Many times, and the prize was often an electric appliance. But we didn't have hydro until 1962, when Ross Wilde and Jack Moles put the hydro in, 
and I'm quite sure Kevin Heffernan had a lot to do with that too. Dad and his musical talents were always offered free at dances, weddings, house parties, or anywhere there was a gathering. He often attended these various functions with his good friend, Vic McManus, who did the calling while Dad played the fiddle. Dad would play from seven in the evening until three in the morning for just a few dollars. Sadly, Mom passed away on January 1st, 1976, at the age of 55. Dad carried on living at home and playing the fiddle for many more years before moving into Fairy Haven Nursing Home in Peterborough. He passed away on April 16th, 1996, at the age of 98. Both are buried in St. Joseph Cemetery in Peterborough. My brother Ray was a self-taught fiddler as well. Dad's grandson, our son, Mark, uh, my son and Emily, which was with us tonight as well. He is an accomplished fiddle player as well. He won the Canadian Grand Masters Fiddling Championship in 2001, 2004, and 2005, as well as Shelburne Fiddle Contest three times as well. He is considered an ambassador. <laughs> Thank you. He is considered an ambassador of the old time fiddle style and has performed throughout Canada and the USA, Japan, Ireland, and Scotland. He teaches music, and his younger daughter, Amelia, is learning to play the fiddle as well. So the tradition carries on. And then we have one daughter as well. Her name is Elkie, and she lives in England, uh, has two, a boy and a girl as well. She married a Brit, so they ended up settling in uh, England. And that's the end of our story. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll turn things back to Karen. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> Dennis and I grew up in the same neighborhood. We played together at night time and, and the same block. Our whole gang played in the same block. <laughs> and then when the street lights came on, everybody fled home. That was the way of the world at that time, and it was a safe, safe place to be. Anyway, and you and, and you get friends that you never ever forget. Like that. Anyway, thank you. Um, I don't know where Mike wants me to go from here. Oh, do we have another speaker? That's it. That's it? That's it. There's lots of food. There's lots of things to look at if you haven't already. And we'll play some more music. One of the uh, CDs is uh, Dennis's Mark playing. Well, we do have uh, a little token of appreciation which we should present. Oh, that's true. And so, Terrence, sure. did you introduce them? Yes. Okay. Kevin, Vicky, and Dennis can come back. Everybody, we just saw you a minute ago. You're back already. <laughs> you can't get rid of the lads. Oh, they're gonna take a picture here. No, I didn't, but I wanted to. <laughs> sure. Did it. Mike? Oh, yeah? Well, I wouldn't have Okay. Well, that, that was an interesting presentation, and, and you know, when I look at it, I see families that held family close, that appreciated one of the generations go by, and you still know, that's my fourth cousin twice removed, and you recognize them, and you acknowledge them, and you know what their strengths and weaknesses. You're building a cabin in the forest, a tree falls on somebody, well, marry him, back to work. Somebody drops dead. 
life just goes on. And the, the think about the hardship in the Canadian wilderness here, we're sitting in a heated building. And you know, you think you're cold in the closet, you go outside for 10 minutes and think, ah, I better get back inside. Well, there was no central heating for these people. They lived in the wild. Maybe they paid somebody to put a cabin up, but it was very, very challenging. And it's the strength of your ancestors that built this country, that built this area. And we can all be proud as we're connected. When we're doing the research on this, uh, I was familiar, of course, with your families. My wife started asking around, be darned if she isn't related to half of too. <laughs> it's just amazing how far the reach is. And going forward, can you imagine how much would we have accomplished in 1825 if we had the internet? Yeah, times change, and we all have our challenges. And that doesn't, I'm not depreciating the youth that are here. Your challenges are different than your grandparents were. And you'll rise to those challenges in ways that we cannot imagine. You'll accomplish things that we can't imagine, that we can't even fathom. And you'll do them better than we can. And I'm not negative on the youth at all. I think that youth have got tremendous potential. And having had the luck to teach in, in university, I was always surprised with each success a generation, the strengths that they brought forward. And why did they bring them forward? Because they had strong parents, and they had strong grandparents, and they had strong great-grandparents. And they may have fled adversity in Ireland to get here, but they built on that adversity and they made us what we are today. So it's been a very interesting presentation. Uh, as uh, Sharon said, we do have refreshments. I do want you to take some time and eat them because we've already paid for them, so they're, <laughs> we might as well get them eaten. Uh, and uh, board members, you want to stand up? Sheila, you're at the back. Yes, Roy, you're there. Sharon. Van's here. Uh, I don't know whether Nancy's here. No, she's here. Nancy's here. here, okay. <laughs> I'm standing, I'm making them stand up because when our annual meeting comes up in May, we'll be looking for some replacement board members. So if you're interested in history and you want to get involved, there's many, many ways to make a difference in our community. And the historical society is evolving too, as we change to meet the next generation's needs and the way history is looked at. So if you can bring something to that, Think it over, you got a couple of months. If you don't want to be on the board, there may be other things that you can do to help us out. It's very rewarding and people that are involved in the community stay in the community and are part of the community. If you stay at home, those ties fade. Next month, uh, we'll be uh, presenting a presentation on Joe Ferreri. Now, those of you in town know Joe is a barber in uh, Lakeville, well, Joe's Barbershop from 1952 until he just retired completely when COVID started. He was still cutting hair there occasionally until 2020. And uh, he's still kicking around, he's living in Piro. Uh, we interviewed him and he's provided his perspective of coming to Lake Frill from Sicily in 1952, speaking not a word of English. How he, fa how he fit in, how he made friends in the community, how he became a success, and how he made his life uh, here make a difference. So. If you have time, uh, what's the date of that meeting, Ch Chilla? Last Thursday in April. I know. <laughs> I was hoping you didn't have the date. But anyway, it is the last Thursday. We'll be sending out an invitation. You may have also noticed on the table that we're collecting donations for a monument, a roll of honor to be put in the Cenotaph Park. That replaces a sign that used to stand there that was built or painted by Joseph Twist. And that's all the people from Lakeville that volunteered in World War II. If we have the money, we may put on World War I and Korea as well. But at the moment, we want to make an inclusive sign to replace that sign, which was destroyed when the sewers were put in in the 1970s. So it's been 50 years since that sign's been there. And I can understand why somebody say, I never saw a damn sign, probably because you weren't born at that time. <laughs> I barely remembered myself. Sharon, however, oh, Sharon yes. remembers <laughs> anyway. <laughs> she used to sit there with her grandkids behind her, but uh, <laughs> So once again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming in. Certainly thank you for setting up these wonderful displays, which were the families did mostly, and, uh, and a lot of work with, with Sharon and her group. And uh, it's good to see you all here, and it's what makes our community what it is today. So thanks once again, and carry on.